Good afternoon, everybody. Or good morning, good evening, depending where you're coming from. A warm welcome to you all, wherever you're dialing in. My name is Bruce Cartwright, CEO at ICAS. I'm delighted to host this webinar on behalf of ICAS. An opportunity, hot off the press, the Bears White Paper, introduced into the UK last Thursday. Here we are on Monday with an opportunity to hear from Sir John Thompson, currently CEO at the FRC. We're going to be also joined by Michelle Mullen as our Director of Standards, who is going to have a fireside chat, question and answer session with Sir John about the paper. Now, Sir John has a fairly illustrious background, formerly CEO of HMRC and also Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Defence within the UK. So some hard hitting jobs there. The FRC, he will be responsible for the new AGA as it comes into place, ARGA. So we're going to see a lot more of Sir John and hear a lot more of him, but we're absolutely delighted. And thank you, I must say up front, John, for making yourself available at short notice within only a few days of the BEZ consultation paper coming out. Format today, um, we are recording this, so we thought it'd be useful for some of you if you want to play it back later. But for today, it's a case of hearing from Sir John for 15, 20 minutes. After Sir John's introduced the subject matter of the day, which is, is the consultation document, uh, we're going to invite Michelle to come straight on stage and join in the conversation. There is a Q&A button. Michelle has some questions she's already prepared, but we will be very willing to take questions as and when we can. So do use the Q&A button and Michelle will keep an eye on that. But for now, my pleasure. So John, thank you indeed for coming to join us at short notice and I'll hand over to you. Well, Bruce, thank you very much. And thanks for the kind invitation to come and talk. As Bruce said, I'm John Thompson. I'm the Chief Executive of the Financial Reporting Council, previously of HMRC and the Ministry of Defence. I've also been the Finance Director of four organisations. I, and I, before that, I worked for Ernst & Young. I'm a double qualified accountant, although I'm not a member of your august body. So in my 15 minutes or so, what I'm going to try and do is to briefly remind you of the purpose and objectives of the Financial Reporting Council, but then spend the majority of my time on the main elements of the so-called audit reform programme, starting with an overview of the totality of the reform before turning to the impact on companies and boards, briefly covering the impact on auditors before turning to the question of a new profession and finishing with an update on the timetable for the consultation document be plenty of time for questions so please go wherever you wish don't restrict yourself to what i'm about to say so to the frc then the purpose of the frc is to serve the public interest by setting high standards in corporate governance corporate reporting and audit and by holding to account those responsible for delivering them we've set four objectives that is setting those high standards and supervising their effectiveness secondly promoting improvements and innovation in these areas Thirdly, transforming the organisation into the fit for purpose independent regulator recommended by Sir John Kingman. And lastly, promoting a more resilient audit market, although exactly what that role is, is to be determined in the future. The combination of audit, accounting and actuarial standards and supervision makes us unique. Our regulatory remit then includes accountants, auditors and actuaries and their respective professional bodies like ICAS. Our remit also includes financial and non-financial reporting by publicly listed companies, as well as adherence to the corporate governance code and the work of registered auditors of the same companies. We regularly publish our assessments of company performance against reporting requirements and the corporate governance code. We also look at best practice in these areas through the FRC lab, for example, latterly ongoing concern. To the question of reform then, and I expect that most of you are familiar with the current codes of best practice and regulatory requirements. However, as you know, this has been an area that's been reviewed three times now, and there were significant uh, recommendations for change. I'm just going to briefly skim those three reviews. The first was by Sir John Kingman, the chairman of Legal in General, and his review was of the Financial Reporting Council itself, and he made 83 recommendations for change. 42 of those were about what we do, and 24 about how we do it. But he did make uh, a small number of other significant recommendations. 
second review by the Competition and Markets Authority was into competition in the audit market. CMA made five recommendations overall, only one of which is relevant to companies, that of minimum standards for an audit committee. Two were for audit firms, those of joint audit and operational separation. And two were regarding the failure of one of the big four, the risk thereof, and the conduct of a further review in due course. And then the final review was by Sir Donald Bryden, the chairman of SAGE, into the quality and effectiveness of audit. Now, he made 67 recommendations for change, 23 for the government, 19 for auditors, 22 for directors or companies, and three about the fundamental scope of an external audit. Now, you're probably familiar with all of that, and you might wonder why is this mad person taking you through these three reviews very briefly. But I do it to say that the recommendations for change impact on a wide range of organisations. This series of rec recommended reforms is not just about auditors. And this program for a long time is called Audit Reform. But the consultation document makes it clear this change is about restoring trust in audit and corporate governance. There's significant change in this for companies. But what will actually be required to deliver this program is a whole systems approach to change. Investors will need to be more engaged in the conduct of a company's business to increase their understanding, in particular of areas such as risk and financial management. Secondly, secondly companies will need to continue to raise standards in areas such as financial management, risk management, performance management, corporate governance, accounting and transparency. That is raising standards of all companies to the standards of the best. Thirdly, a fundamental change for auditors on their role their responsibilities, their behavior, their conduct, and their training and qualifications. And lastly, for the FRC, a fundamentally new approach is required, which changes the organization radically, scraps it actually from that which was reviewed by Sir John Kingman back in 2018. If you weren't aware, the government's propositions were published last Thursday, the 18th of March. Of course, post the consultation, what I'm about to say may change the propositions in that consultation document, and we're very interested in what you all think and are likely to say. So to the question of boards and company reform, then let me start with some edited highlights. Many of the recommendations go to the heart of the responsibility of the board, and a small number directly impact on non-executive directors. The clear policy thinking from ministers is that the board is responsible in law for the running of the company. And therefore, many of the recommendations made are in principle easy to agree because they are built around this fundamental principle. In the Kingman review, the most significant recommendation which directly impacts on the board is probably his recommendation that we should adopt something similar to Sarbanes-Oxley in the United States. It is my personal view that this is very welcome. And the government has made it clear that it is in favour of companies reporting on the effectiveness of internal control. But it has left some options in the consultation. And those options revolve around the nature of the statement made by directors and the extent to which that statement is audited. Implementation of this is a significant undertaking and we have shared some early work with the excellent help of the Audit Committee Chairs Forum led by John Lennox about how we might implement such an obligation on directors. If you're not familiar with the ACCIF, it's a forum of around 80% of the FTSE 350 Audit Committee Chairs and was positively commented on by both Kingman and Bryden. I should make it clear here though that although I'm about to say applies to several of the propositions, what is proposed is to start only with companies with a premium listing or around 800 companies at present, not all public interest entities and definitely not all companies. So this change, significant as it is, is not likely to be coming to uh, all public interest entities anytime soon. And I'll come back to this definition of what is a pie in a minute. Secondly, then, another significant aspect of Kingman which directly impacts on the board was that all directors should be within scope of potential regulatory action instead of only those who happen to be qualified accountants, which is the current regime. Again, something we welcome. I realise this might be controversial for those of you who are non-executive directors and increase your exposure to regulatory action. We expect that you would have a strong view on this. 
uh, and about whether it's proportion. To be clear, just because all directors are potentially in scope, it does not automatically follow that they would all be subject of enforcement or regulatory action. After review, we would decide who was or was not deficient in carrying out their responsibilities. Now, over the last six months, I've spoken to more than a thousand non-executive directors of PLCs, and in general, they all see the logic of the proposal on one hand, but we need to be very clear here. This change does increase the potential risk exposure for non-executive directors and their liability. A third major change for boards would be the idea of joint audit, a recommendation made by the CMA. Actually, this recommendation will not be accepted, largely because we do not consider it can actually be implemented in the UK. Instead, we worked up an alternative, which is called managed shared audit. Now, if you talk to audit committee chairs, they fairly universally say that what they want from the lead audit partner is someone with sector specific knowledge because for example auditing a bank is very different than that of a retailer or a mineral extractor and therefore to diversify the market we have to give non big four auditors experience of auditing larger more complex companies and for them to be exposed to both the consolidation of the accounts and the audit committee process we believe that managed shared audit will do that Fourthly, and perhaps most significantly, is the response to the recommendation in Kingman that we revisit the definition of a public interest entity. Now, after listening quite carefully to a wide range of views, there was an increasing view that more regulation on publicly listed companies increased the differ differential with privately owned companies. Now, after careful consideration, ministers are minded to level that up with the significant expansion of the definition of a public interest entity specifically that the expanded definition of a pie would operate to extend the scope of existing audit and corporate reporting requirements uh, which apply in relation to pies and frame those uh, the scope of any new regulatory measures in relation to audit corporate reporting and corporate governance in other words there's an extension of the definition of pie into largest privately owned companies in the uk uh, so whilst ministers are minded to extend the UK's pies definition to include large companies within certain limits, regardless of whether they're admitted to trading on a regulated market. So this will, for example, ensure that large private companies are now included. Now, the consultation document lays out the options for what does large private company mean, and it revolves around turnover, number of employees and balance sheet strength. Other changes are to include companies on AIM with a market capitalization above 200 million euros, and a, but then a very open question about Lloyd syndicates and large third sector entities. Fifthly for companies is the CMA's recommendation of minimum standard for membership qualifications and experience of an audit committee members, and the oversight of the work of audit committees by the regulator if he considered intervention was required. Now, Sir Donald made a whole series of recommendations which go to the heart of how transparent the audit committee is, how the audit committee functions, how it reports, the role of the chair, and the connections between an audit and a risk committee where they're both uh, in existence. Again, we've started some early work on this. I personally met several hundred audit committee chairs to understand more about how they operate their committee, and this will help us to form a proposition in 2021. For those of you who happen to be audit committee chairs, you or your audit committee members will be able to engage with this in due course. Lastly, then, for companies are a series of changes to corporate reporting, including the new resilience statement setting out companies' views about risk over the medium term, up to five years ahead. The new audit insurance policy setting out the company's arrangements over three years, including internal audit. Enhanced reporting on payment practices and a new statement on distributable profits and linked to that a new statement on the legality of dividends. A brief word then about auditors. You may have already seen us make some changes to the way in which we supervise the largest audit firms, including the voluntary adoption of operational separation. That is the idea of putting the audit practice at arm's length from the rest of the firm. You might have seen two of the big four also state that they'll be selling other elements of the firm. And you may have seen KPMG splitting the traditional role of the managing partner into two. 
overall, we are seeing the introductions of elements of the corporate governance code into the running of the big four, including better governance and non-executive directors. And all of these reforms are aimed at one single goal, higher audit quality. Other key changes for auditors will include a new and more transparent framework to explain why they resign out of rotation, clearer reporting on the results of an audit in a way that others can more clearly engage in, including the concept of graduated findings, moving to managed shared audit for some of our largest companies to give experience to smaller audit firms, enhanced obligations to work on the risk of material fraud, and the audit being extended to include elements of the annual report like APMs or KPIs, which are linked to remuneration, subject to the audit committee of the company deciding who is best suited to do such work. Now, to the big idea in Sir Donald Bryden's review of a new profession. The government believes that a new, distinct professional body for corporate auditors should be created to help create a climate for wider audit and enable good audit practice to thrive across corporate audit disciplines. However, whilst being clear that it is in favour, the government is also seeking views on how a new distinct professional body for corporate auditors actually helps drive better audit quality. And assuming there is a view that a new profession is preferable to a range of questions uh, arise, for example, what would be the best way of establishing a new professional body for corporate auditors? What transitional arrangements would be needed for new members of that body? Whether corporate auditors should be required to be members or obtain qualifications from another professional body, like ICAS, for example. And whether a new professional audit body should cover all corporate auditors or just those who do PIs. Now, those are all very open questions and there remains much to debate in relation to the profession. Now, let me conclude with where we are on these reforms and what happens next. So, as I said, the government published its key documents for the next stage last week. That was the consultation document and the regulatory impact assessment. The consultation document sets out the government's proposals in 11 chapters, 220 pages, and several annexes, including one which tracks every one of the recommendations made and the government's approach. Now, not every recommendation is being taken forward, but more than 80% of them are. A further 10% or so are being amended in some way, and around 10% are not being taken forward. Essentially, the consultation document sets out the original recommendation, views from those initial consultations, the government's policy thinking, a proposal to implement, and a question to respond to. And therefore, any reader of the consultation document can clearly see what is being recommended by the government as the action it would take in relation to the recommendation that was made to it. In publishing a consultation document, the government is then seeking views on the proposed course of action, and it will be open to any individual company or other organization to respond to those questions. Overall, this is a significant package of changes, and I've just skimmed the surface of them. The regulatory impact assessment is a document that sets out what this is all going to cost. And there are three recommendations which we believe have additional costs for companies which are more than insignificant. The first of those is the implementation of Sarbanes-Oxley regime, where, I, as I said, the consultation document sets out three options around attestation. Secondly, the introduction of minimum standards for audit com committees, the idea of a, a regulatory framework that everyone has to reach, clearly has some additional costs for smaller companies, generally uh, uh, at the lower end of the listed market. And thirdly, Sir John Kingman's recommendation that the number of companies within regulatory scope is expanded, this idea of the redefinition of a public interest entity. I've spoken about all three of those reforms briefly. So in brief, the consultation document's out. It's open for views from anyone who wants to express them by the 8th of July. Thank you for listening very patiently to me for 15 minutes. I look forward to your questions. And now back to Michelle. Thanks very much, Sir John. I've been really fortunate to hear you speak about these reforms over the last six months. Um, we've been waiting on this consultation paper for a wee while. And for many of those, the audience today, this is probably the first time that they've heard the, the reform programme articulated in the terms that it's, it's not as much about, it's not, in fact, it's as, it is as much about corporate governance and corporate reporting as it is about 
audit. And I think it was only when I, I saw the consultation paper and saw it side by side that that really struck home. Um, it's a big document to digest, and I, I do feel I've only scratched the surface. Um, so I'm hoping over the next hour, we'll be able to cover a number of the key aspects um, for the audience. So if I look at my first question for you, and um, I, mean, I appreciate it, it, when I read the consultation paper, it, it definitely um, resonated with me that ARGA is going to be a regulatory powerhouse when it's finally up and running. Um, and it won't be able to happen overnight. There's going to be a lot of choreography involved before we, we can get um, from A to B. But my, my opening question is probably in two parts. What do you see as the top three initiatives that the FRC will now take forward while it awaits the outcome of this 16 week consultation and obviously its legislative mandate? And what are the top three initiatives that you think ARGA needs to look to deliver as soon as legislation permits? Uh, thanks. And I think we should make it transparent for all of the uh, people who are, are on this. You didn't tell me what the questions were in advance, so I'm no, to react to it as <laughs> we are going. So I think it's worth being up about it. Um, what would my top three be? Well, look, I mean, so I think that it's really important to say that if you read the consultation document, what you get is an in-principle decision that the government's uh, proposing to move forward with X, Y, or Z. But you don't actually get the detail of how it proposes to do that, because that's for another phase. And therefore, what we have to turn our attention to whilst the consultation is still open is which areas could we actually do some further work to deepen our understanding of an actual proposition um, and how would we do that now that doesn't have to actually complete in the consultation document period it can last uh, probably all, almost to the end of the current uh, um, current year if we wanted it to so top i think for me would be how do we actually implement something like SOX, which takes account of the fact there are 50 dual listed companies in the uk in the us um, so that they don't have to do something separate. How does it also take account of the FCA's senior managers regime? Because it, it needs to dovetail into both. And, you know, so what's a practical way in which we can implement it? And it company only has to do one thing and it satisfies multiple regulators. So working that out, I think, is, is something we could do some, some quite detailed work on. I think second for me would be the idea of the audit committee regulatory framework. What, is, what does that look like? I said, as I said, I've, I've talked to hundreds and hundreds of audit committee chairs. Um, and so we got some ideas about what sort of minimum standards, what might we want to introduce. But then we, we need to be quite open about that. So even when we draft something up, it is my very, very strong personal view that the FRC should then publish something, get some further views, work up a second proposition and so on. I, I would never want to move forward on something so significant for companies that we were, it was just kind of at some point in the future, we say, ta-da, there you go. So that's sort of two for me. After that, um, I think some of the reporting, the new reporting is is really kind of interesting. You know, what exactly is a resilient statement? How can you do, um, how can you do it in line with Mr. Donald's review? Um, recommendations a one year a two year and a five year view um, I think many colleagues on this call and indeed well beyond it will all have a strong view about how do you do that and how do you get some audit assurance on that so those are probably my top three things to work on and actually I think the first two would be the most impactful ones in terms of this reform package to be uh, honest um, but my I think the, the big thing for the audit firms is the one that we move forward on anyway, which is operational separation, which we've done on a, a, a negotiated and voluntary basis because it has already, I think, begun to make a difference in the way in which the audit firms are governed, in the way they're run, how they produce management information, their financial reporting, uh, and they've begun to recruit some excellent uh, non-executive directors to kind of help them steer that. And I, we can already excuse me, we can already see the difference that that's making. So I think that those would be my three to work on, but slightly different three in terms of what make the big difference. Uh, going forward. Perfect. I mean, if I look at the, the consultation, 
Th this is really a consultation that brings direct responsibility and accountability back into sharp focus, doesn't it? Oh, that was that was swift. Um, I mean, the straightforward answer to that is yes. But uh, as I said, the, the the policy thinking here was was crystal clear from from the off, actually, from the previous Secretary of State and as well as the current one, which is, you know, in law, the 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 directors run the company, right? And they they are the people who make the decisions or or don't make the decisions that do or don't lead to success, and um, therefore that they're the people who are responsible for that. And if we're going to see a step change in the quality of corporate reporting and therefore um, audit then we need to place more responsibility on the directors now we understand as i said in my introductory remarks that for some of the non-executives this is potentially quite a significant change um, you know it's being made absolutely clear that you're responsible if you're on the audit committee i think your workload may increase mm, depends on how big uh your audit committee is now how big the company is where you are in maturity terms of so some audit committees this is potentially more work i also uh i'm clear that this increases risk for non-executive directors uh, in in particular and to be upfront about it and i'm sure that some of your your colleagues are thinking this well, what does that mean about remuneration for non-executive directors? So, you know, if you increase responsibility and you increase risk, it's logical that it flows through into, into remuneration. Um, so, yes, it's it's quite explicit. I'm being as explicit and open as I can on, on this call. And I do think it, it's something in which people will react to. Um, so, yeah. Um, and there's quite a lot of audit committee chairs on this call. When I had a look at the attendance list. Um, the classification of a pine, if I go back to the beginning of where it all stems from, it, it strikes me the classification of a pie uh, or a company or an entity as a pie is fairly critical going forward. And the consultation paper has a few options. And there's a, you know, as you've articulated, the impact assessment is between, um, you know, I think 145 million to 200 million per annum. Do you have a view as to, I mean, because government's got options here. Do you have a view as to what types of entities will be captured within or should be captured within the scope of a pie? Yes, so we, we so there's a very general point, which is there is absolutely no difference between the FRC's view and the government's view about this consultation document. We, we don't think this is great and that's not whatever. This was a jointly written document that has been published by, by the government and we did an awful lot of the the work which then went through the civil service process up to ministers so we ought to be really clear there, there is no difference between the government and us on, on these issues so we are in favor of the extension of, of the definition of a public interest entity into large private companies and i think you will we will find in due course that parliamentarians are also very much in favor of that where i think we've seen some of the worst corporate behavior in privately owned companies which have collapsed um i mean you know we could all think of some i, I won't i won't quote some but if you actually say you know that's outside the regulatory scopes you can't do anything about it but because you happen to be publicly listed then you can do something about it that that does not sit easily with parliamentarians they want to know what action if anything can be taken against people who who may uh Sorry, my phone just rang. Um, who, who may well have crashed the company, right? And and and, but but rightly, I think we listen very very carefully to publicly listed companies saying, "Well, hang on, hang on a minute. If you just continue to raise uh, these burdens on us, this is an increasing gulf between us and being privately owned, and therefore it increases the attractiveness of private equity, a private, you know, going private, and so on and so forth. So, can you do something about rebalancing that? And the answer to that is yes. So, on, on both those fronts regulatory differential and trying to tackle parliamentarians concerns about private uh, companies uh, crashing and being sort of unaccountable for that um that was why that is the logical extension and the the criteria toy the consultation document toys with options around the weights um definition so james waits's corporate governance code for private companies uh, uses turnover employees and balance sheet strength now if you use and with those three criteria you end up with a, about a thousand companies we think if you use the word or 
you get to something more like 1800 additional companies come within scope now that is pretty ex significant expansion on 2200 now so almost doubling after that it's pretty it's a pretty open question you know should we include lloyd syndicates or, or not what about large charities is essentially where they wanted to go uh, or not local authorities actually is subject to a separate redmond review and there are ongoing discussions between us and the department of health and social care about whether um nhs trust or nhs bodies should be within within scope uh, as well but we need to work that out also with the nao um, so you are seeing significant expansion but there are some very open questions Funny, the, the, the little words are sometimes the most important, are they? The and or the or, is it the should or the shall, is in, is the, the, in the context of ethics. Can I ask a question about directors? And then and I'm starting to see quite a lot of questions coming through. There's often a distinction drawn between executive directors and non-executive directors. And, uh, and there is no distinction in law. And I found it very interesting that in the consultation paper, it doesn't make that distinction. Um, it's a feature and it's a wealth and a feature of the UK Unitary Board. Expanding on, on the introductory points, what do you think are the key key points that PI directors and, and for that and including non-execs need to consider in light of this consultation, given the regulatory oversight and powers that Argo is going to have over them? Hmm. Well, you get very different reactions from different people as to this as a package of reform no great surprise is it i mean i think in in general the reaction we have had from executives is okay uh you know so you want us to be there's some new reporting and some more transparency but it you know but it's largely unchanged for us uh i think that's probably reasonable if you if you're in a you're running a reasonably well-run company there's there's very little difference in it for you for the non-execs i think it's really quite different and People have pointed out that this might create some tension, for example, between the chair and the and the order committee chair. I'm be interested in people's views about whether that's uh, true or not. It certainly does place more reliance on raising the profile of the order committee and the order committee chair, and the work of the order committee and the reporting of the order committee. And um, but again, and I think I've said this to you privately, many audit committees of PLCs are run really well and i don't think they particularly will regard this as being anything at all they'll know the state of internal control um they'll be able to say yeah fine, we can meet all these minimum standards what this is trying to do is is to identify those companies that really are quite a long way from any kind of minimum standards and so you've got quite a, work, a lot of work to do so i was talking to an order committee chair of a list of company premium list of company the other day who said the order committee chair, the order committee was him it just isn't that just isn't good enough is it? i mean with the greatest respect to to the gentleman concerned that really isn't going to cut the mustard in the future so there's a lot of work for him to do but you know equally talking to the order committee chair of a major high street bank the other day said yeah fine no problem we, you know anything you say we're not going to have to do anything really because i can tell you everything exactly where we are now so i think these reforms land in a very differential way uh depending on the size of the company how well the company is run now um and it does land differentially on on non-executives and, and executives and when we recognize that and i'm being open about it um, and i'm interested in what people's views are well let me go to some of those views in fact and, and questions so um and i won't identify who the questions are coming from but this individual said this is a huge and important agenda that if implemented well and holistically has the prospect of making a real positive difference to the quality of governance reporting and audit in the UK, um, not just to help avoid some of the large failures we've seen, but also to help prepare pies. And I think you've, you've articulated preparing the companies that are going to fall into this scope um, for that pandemic, post-pandemic world. So the question from this individual is, which aspects do you think will be the most challenging to implement and why? Ooh. Uh, that is really that is a really tricky question. Um, it's always terrible if someone like me says, "Oh, it's a great question," but that is that is tricky. I mean, it, I think in the in the last four months, I've spoken at thirty one events, and the the truth is that um, 
you get a very different reaction from from large numbers of people about this is the most that's most difficult this is most difficult that's most difficult i think on a on a technical basis the the most difficult one might be the new statement on distributable reserves uh and the consequential legality of dividends and the consultation document makes some recognition that in large and complex groups what exactly are distributable reserves can, can be really quite uh quite difficult to calculate or, or indeed estimate so uh, and i was talking to uh, a well-known professional standards person this morning actually who said oh that that is not as easy as you think it's going to be that is that is quite tricky on a technical basis that might be really quite a tricky thing to to define so I, i'm putting that up as a straw as a straw man if you like to see to see what people's reaction is um i don't i don't underestimate there were some really quite big changes with some cost on but that one might be technically the most difficult I, I, there, there's a, a question here. Someone's after my own heart, saying, given the emphasis on board stepping up, shouldn't the new body be called governance reporting and the audit authority? That is a sequence that most of us recognise. So, John, I think I've lost that battle. <laughs> I think ARGA has just, we've got used to the acronym, so I've, I've given up trying to change the name. I'm afraid that boat uh, sailed a long time ago when Sir John Mink Kingman sat in a room and decided what it was called about three years ago. Sorry. Let me have a look at some of it. Well, let, let me ask one of the questions. I mean, internal controls, a few questions coming through in internal controls. Um, because you, you've highlighted it's one of the top three things that the FRC will have to um, start to prepare for and the ARGA will have to, to deliver. And certainly when we engage with quite a number of our members when we were preparing our submissions for um, both the CMA market study and also the, the Bryden review, their members in business who hold senior board positions um, gave us feedback that they thought more could be done to clarify the respective roles of the various parties and to improve the accountability to directors. So it's interesting to see that that was the general direction of travel. Um, that particular group actually was, was chaired by Philip Johnston. And I'll, I'll hand over to him because I think he's wanting to pose a question. Um, I mean, it's fair to say when you talked about the, the range of pies, pie directors of premium listed, they understand they've got resp responsible roles and, and you know, they're held accountable. Um, and those, those with experience of US SOX requirements, they certainly fed back to us that they appreciated the benefits, including the quality of the information on which um, management then subsequently relied for decision making. Mm. My question is, does the FRC have a view on, in terms of the three options that's in the conduct? One of them is non-mandated assurance from the auditor, and I think that's the one that government is suggesting is the initially preferred option. But do you have a view in terms of which one is, is the preferred option, or is it the same as the definition of PI, FRC and BAS are aligned on this? Well, look, we are aligned on this and that is the preferred option of the government which is border border attestation with uh, an opinion from the auditor but not an audit for sure of an audit now i mean i think you can make the case that there ought to be an audit particularly because this is this, this reform is not is in in many senses a very mild version of socks it's not it's nothing like socks in the in the way in which it's been implemented in, in the united in the us it's quite narrowly drawn it's about financial reporting. It's not all internal control. Um, it doesn't have the the, the the expansive nature of of SOX in the US. So it is a sort of milder version of it. But it's a starting point, isn't it? And um, elsewhere in the document, uh, it actually says, well, you know, some once the government might might legislate for this introduction, in due course, Arga might raise a bar, so it might increase the scope. Of, so we need to be really clear about this because I, I think your question might have implied that it's coming in, it's coming in for everyone. But, it's, but I really need to be clear: it's not. It's only for premium listed companies initially. Then our Arga will be given the powers to decide whether to expand or not. So it would not be coming to those newly defined public interest entities, the large privates. That would they would not be required to implement it uh, to start with. So 
Arga would introduce it, it would take stock over two or three years and then decide whether it should be expanded. And the question which is at the heart of this is, is it proportionate to the risk? And if you are um, a small listed company, then you've got to ask a question about whether it is proportionate or not. So there's, there was rightly, I think, quite a significant lobby from the Quoted Companies Alliance, which represents the smaller companies uh, which are publicly listed, the smallest one of which is, I think, £14 million pounds market cap. You know, is it is it really proportionate for us to say, you know, you introduce, you have to introduce this? And the answer to that was, we, d we didn't think it was initially. So let's do a premium listing. Let's, let's introduce that. And then later in this decade, whenever that happens to be, uh, uh, then you can take stock and decide whether you want to expand or not. So I, I think that's a proportionate way of going about it. Thanks. I'm going to bring Philip in here for a question. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Michelle. So, John, um, as Michelle said, that I chaired the or led the submissions of, on the three uh, uh, reviews. Uh, and when we looked at, uh, at what was already in place, uh, with the listing rules, uh, with corporate governance code, you could say that there is a requirement there uh, that uh, should have stopped uh, or should have identified so, some of the internal control uh, weaknesses that unfortunately came to bear uh, when the high profile failures happened. Uh, and in the, in, in the document, uh, the government is proposing uh, on building on the current requirements, but it, it didn't stop the, the initial concerns or, or the initial uh, failures. Uh, but also you've already mentioned about the premium listed companies, but those failures that we saw that are high profile and have driven a lot of, of, of what's been happening uh, over the last uh, uh, a couple of years, uh, weren't in that premium space. You know, Patisserie Valerie, for example, and then BHS was, uh, that particular time was a private company. So given what you've, um, what, what's in the paper and you've said that you're aligned with what Bayes are, are, are saying, if you look at, at that point of premium against reality of where, where these, these, these areas uh, uh, or, or these failures occurred, do you think that you actually achieve what you want to achieve by developing on the current requirements, restricting it to a high level uh, of, of companies that are going to be required to give further disclosures? Uh, or will we actually find ourselves in a position where FTSE 350s or, or lower uh, elements of, uh, uh, of the FTSE 100 uh, will be the areas where we, we, we see again uh, considerable uh, uh, f or failures uh, and considerable concern. Well, look, thanks for your question. So, so let me try and travel travel with you. So, first of all, I think we could be we, we should be explicit. It, and I agree with you. It, it is my view that we could have introduced this reform through a combination of the listing rules and the corporate governance code. We could have done that. Uh, and we did come to that conclusion, but I think rightly, Minister Saw, it's, it's actually cleaner and uh, more straightforward and honest to say a recommendation was made. We agree with that recommendation. So let's uh, give Arga the powers to introduce this. We know that it, the report doesn't say this, but I, I acknowledge that we could have introduced it through the listing rules and the corporate governance code because the code is voluntary uh, and ministers did toy with should you make the code mandatory? Now, actually, we persuaded ministers to not go down that route, and it's a bit of a tangent, but I agree with you, we could have brought it in that, that way, but it's not being brought in that way. Uh, again, I ought to clarify my answer to, to Michelle's earlier questions. We're not restricting ourselves in the sense, we have to start this somewhere. So the plan is to start with premium list of companies, of which there are around 800 out of the 2,000 or so uh, listed on the main market take stock and then decide where to go. Now, my, my view is, and this is only my view, uh, this will be for my successor to decide with the relevant board, is that actually post-premium companies 
where the government should go is to large private companies. There are some extremely large private companies in, in the UK that would enter you know, the FTSE 100, FTSE 350. And, and if you're thinking about it in proportionality terms and in potential public interest terms about what would the loss be if those companies collapsed, as you, you quoted, you quoted one, for example, uh, actually it would be better if you then went, the, the, the second step was into the large private companies sort of over uh, a significant threshold, whatever that threshold is. And then you again took stock. So it isn't being restricted. The powers that Argo will be given could be to introduce it for any public interest entity. It's just on saying we have to start the journey somewhere. We start with premium listed and then we move from there. Now that does bring the prospect of regulatory uh, increases over a number of years, quite a number of years potentially. But I, I think we just thought we ought to be upfront about that. It, it, it's a proportionate place to start, start there, take stock, then decide where you're going to go. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Philip. Sorry. Um, so, John, I think we could spend most of the afternoon talking about internal controls of the rate equations that's coming through, but I'll, I'll save myself for one or two more. Um, so, uh, and this, this particular question is coming from, I, I know, an investor angle. So on internal controls, how is the FRC balancing the increased assurance of a SOX regime versus the attractiveness or otherwise of the UK as a venue to do business? Well, ministers are very clear that this is a package of reform that makes us uh, more attractive for inward investment. I mean, the UK is generally seen globally as a high standards economy. So, you know, if, if the corporate reporting says X, Y, Z, then you can rely on X, Y, Z. And what this does is is strengthen the assurance which investors can take from corporate reporting. It's it's as clear as that in terms of the policy thinking. Now I know that there will be there is some reaction to uh, you know it's going to cost. I mean the most this whole entire package costs is 169 million pounds a year, and all the, all the relevant companies. I, I think I'm get away with saying only given that these are the, the very largest companies uh, uh, in, in the UK. Now, that's not, it's not, it's more than insignificant, but it's actually, if you work it out per company, it's, it's, it's in the hundreds of thousands of pounds per, per year. Now, ministers think that's a price worth paying to increase assurance on corporate reporting, which makes us a more attractive place to invest. It's as simple as that. One of the other questions was around about timing, but I think you've given an answer as to to when when this might um, we might see the internal controls framework. Can I move us on to resilience? Uh, well, hang, 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 hang on. Hang on. Yeah, look, I think there's a really important thing to say about timing, which is so the regulatory impact assessment assumes Arga and these legislative changes are brought in in April 2023, but. As you have rightly said, this is a significant package, and I do not believe that we can ask for this entire package to implement, be implemented in one financial year. So, for example, periods ending after 31st December 2023. We, we just can't do that. We're going to have to work out some sort of phasing, probably over three years. So although the law may bring AGA into being and give AGA the powers to introduce these changes, I is my strong view that these will probably be introduced in, in 23, 24 and 25 in terms of the company's obligation to introduce that. And we know that we need to be much more open and explicit about these are the changes, these are when they impact. Uh, and we would do that in, in, a, in a further round of, of consultation, possibly the end of this year, possibly into early 22. I think one of the challenges is going for the FRC and ARG is going to be the choreography of all of this certainly is. There's a few questions coming through about resilience statement um, and I mean I think from from the feedback that I've certainly received um, the introduction of the resilience statement and the, the audit assurance policy has been welcomed by business and investors alike. Um, this question is what challenges do you see in avoiding boilerplate text in resilience statements reporting? 
you know, we've got a cynical oh, view brilliant. here. Says, Aren't we just going to get the same old gratuitous statement around the rose tinted view from the boardroom? <laughs> Well, yeah, that is that is definitely the risk because, you know, we, we look, let's be open about it. We we all know that you know the big firms or producer. This is what a resilience statement should look like. Uh, we'll almost certainly do a review of what the the first batch looked like and say, well, you know, Sainsbury's got it right, and we we're not too sure about these other ones because that's that's what we do. We have to promote best best practice right in in this regard. But I I have, as I said in my introductory remarks. The one area where you consistently get feedback from boards is the lack of engagement by investors. And what we need is for investors to get more engaged in, if we have a resilience statement, what would be interesting for you to find out? That it avoids being boilerplating, that it does actually say something that you and the market can assess. And... Uh, I've talked to many, many chairmen about this, and they broadly sort of say it's about an 80 20% split. 80% of investors aren't engaged, 20% are. We need, we need to change that. And that was one of the reasons why we uh, issued a new stewardship code, raised the bar significantly on the stewardship code back at the right at the end of 2019. And we're currently doing our first round of assessments of those codes. And we are, will continue to go down this route of saying you cannot passively sit by on billions of pounds worth of investments you're going to have to get involved in understanding what the company's culture is what it's trying to do what risk it's running what it's assuming on its financial management you can't just do this all by rote through a proxy advisors you're going to have to do something more than that because you're investing my pension money and i'm not happy with it and so that that in terms of getting investors engaged in what do they want I think will also be a key factor. And I have to say for the 20% of the market that does get engaged, they are fantastically interested in, in this and they can fairly clearly give you a view about what works for them really quite quickly. And we've set up an investors advisory group in the last few months who are giving some very clear views about, well, oh, that would be interesting information. Um, and in parallel work, we've actually said, the yeah, annual report's a bit long, isn't it? This is some things that we can take out of the annual report to which the answer is yes we don't really we're not really interested in x y z a b c so there is also potentially in this a sort of uh a deregulatory agenda of stripping some of that annual report now which i'll happily talk about a bit more if you want me to great to get it fair balanced and, and understandable and um, the, the consultation look, looks for views on whether the resilience statement could provide a means for tcfd reporting i'm raising this because of course glasgow's hosting cop 26 this year um but it leaves it open to the company as part of the audit and assurance policy to decide if that resilient statement is going to be subject to independent assurance. Does the FRC have a view on the future role of audit in the context of climate change reporting? I think if I look at the opportunity for the profession, that clearly is one of the, the areas. I'm sorry, the, the, the key verb in that sentence, I missed, I, I, uh, you missed out. What, what is it? What's Do you have a again? view on the future role of audit in the context of, of climate change reporting? We, we, we do. It's for the audit committee to decide. Um, so we, we've been very, very clear about what we think should be reported on for some time now. We're in favour of TCS, TCFD as a framework, but that doesn't really have any metrics in it. So we've said uh, until there is an international consensus on ESG metrics, our view is that you should use the SASB metrics um, and those can be tailored to, uh, they, they are, but the basket of measures under SASB is tailored to suit what kind of uh, company, what kind of business you're in. So if you're a mineral extractor, they're different than a retailer. So we've been in favor of that for a long time. Now, the proposition is that those should be assured but it's for the audit committee uh, under the audit and insurance policy to decide uh, how it wants to do that. Now, what that does is open up the door to specialist assurance providers, those who uh, operate in this market. And there are a number of specialists in this. Like you don't necessarily have to go back to your auditor and say, can you now do this? But that's, you know, audit committee chairs could decide to do that. Audit committees could decide to do that. But equally, they might say, actually, given the significant impact of climate risk on us and uh, you know where we are in terms of carbon neutrality we'll get a specialist in and it gives 
the audit committee that flexibility. There, there's nothing that says you can't have a one-stop shop for all the things that now needs to be ordered to. That, that's pretty clear that. But that's within the gift of the audit committee and, and we're very content with that as a proposition. I mean, there's a couple of questions about the, the corporate auditor piece. I think I mean, climate change reporting is, is, is one of the future opportunities. And ICAS has been developing a roadmap to corporate auditors. I'd like to ask the chair of the ICAS working group, David Cruikshank, if he would like to, um, to pose a question in, in relation to the, the corporate auditor framework that's set out in the consultation paper or, or the future. Yeah, thank you, Michelle, and thank you, Sir John, uh, for doing this so quick on the heels of the, the, the paper. Um, so many questions that we could ask about the uh, standalone corporate order to profession, but I suppose just two, um, one that leads on from where Michelle was, um, and that is really how to make sure, how to engage those who are providing assurance who aren't statutory auditors, so those uh, providing assurance on ESG metrics, cyber and so on, how to bring them into the tent in the way that the consultation document and uh, Sir Donald Bryden's recommendations envisage that the new corporate order to profession would be broad enough to encompass all of the, all the activities of assurance that are going on. And I suppose a subset of that question is, you know, you envisaging that Argo would require that they be involved in some way, or do you think the market will sort of take care of it with institutional investors and others saying that they really ought to be inside that tent? So that was, the, that was the first question. My second question is a, a difficult one and an easy one in a way because it's short, but, but difficult. But just timescales for the establishment of the uh, corporate auditor profession, because as you sort of indicated in your introduction, but also as this comes through in the paper, you know, there's a lot of moving parts there and uh, just be interested to get your own views on, you know, how, how long you think it might take to get it all up and running. Oh, a great question. Uh, <laughs> oh, that is brilliant. So let's do the first one first, because that, that, that is, is potentially easier. So we have done very little work yet on identifying those parties who could be within the scope of what Donald envisaged, but are not currently statutory auditors. We, we just need to be upfront about that. There have been lots of other things to do. But we know that we know some of them and we know some are, are out there. I mean, Donald quoted a, a wide range of potential areas where there could be assurance providers. Some are much more uh, apparent than others. So cyber, for example, much more apparent um, than some of the others, which, which he quoted. But, but we have to be upfront about it. There's no point in me saying it's been top of my list and look, I've met the following people because we haven't done, we haven't really done very much of that work. So we have not yet worked out who might be the sort of parties who might be brought in uh will the market resolve and then related to that will, will the market resolve this question or not well i it is my view uh that the market probably would resolve it yes because you can see the logic i mean if i was the audit committee chair of a major company i'd be thinking well do i want to be the party who has to integrate this assurance together or wouldn't I, would I prefer to go to one place to get my assurance? And you can naturally assume that some of our larger audit firms might think, well, actually it might be helpful for us if we had a, a cyber assurance wing, and, and many of them do. Uh, but maybe now we need to, we need to have a, an environmental assurance uh, faculty or, or whatever. And actually what we can then say is, we know you need to do the statutory audit, but in, in relation to these aspects of your annual review where you're seeking some assurance, we, we can do those as well. Um, and, you know, I would not blame an audit committee chair who said, actually, I'd, I'd just like to go to one place. I don't, I don't want to have five different assurance providers. Uh, you know, so the market may well resolve this question. Um, it, I think is, is I would, I'd be stunned if the market didn't, if the market didn't resolve that situation and that many of the bigger firms could do all of could do all of it. Uh, some of them will tell you they can do it all now. Uh, I'll stick my neck out on that. Uh, that might be a bit controversial for some people are on this uh, call. Time scales. Well, look, the, the government is is being clear that it is supporting in principle the recommendation, but there are many many questions, and I 
I sketched out some of them in my introductory remarks, and there there are more in the consultation document. I've got it to my right. So I'm just having a quick scan of it. Yeah? Um, until we can resolve those questions, it's actually quite difficult to work out what does this new profession look like. So so look, let, let, let's be upfront about it. If if you said you become a member of ICAS uh, and a chartered accountant. And then ICAS says, well, if you take some additional learning, you can also qualify as a corporate auditor. That would seem like a logical commercial proposition, wouldn't it? By, by your own institute. I mean, I can imagine that, that you would probably try to do that for all kinds of sensible reasons. Become a chartered accountant, become a corporate auditor, two for one, right? Some additional modules, some additional learning, get second qualification. Um, but that's just one of the questions. And until we can actually get some sense about people's reaction to some really quite deep questions, I, I, I'm not prepared to say, oh, you know, to use Sadal's phrase, I can give birth to this thing in 2028 20, or something. It's, it's, just too, it's just too difficult to say. And it's just better to be upfront about, I'm not, we're not putting any timescale on it until we get much clearer view from the market about whether this welcome, how it works and so on and so forth. Yeah, just on that, I mean, as Michelle said, we've we've had a little working group at ICAS that's been working through the how to how it could all happen. And we've we've worked up some proposals which we must share with you. That's not published yet, but I think it's probably likely to be published in two or three weeks. And it does, not surprisingly, yes, it does envisage that part of the answer would be you qualify at ICAS, then you go on and do a further qualification and regular MOTs and uh, and, all, and all the rest of it. Um, and also that there would be a route there for the, the non-financial statement auditors who wouldn't come through ICAS, but would nevertheless have some sort of uh, qualification of cor as corporate auditor, recognising their different speciality skills. And I suppose, John, if I could go back to the first question again, you know, with the, about the market taking care of it. If you've got a smaller a boutique firm, let's say, doing environmental auditing um, or cyber security assurance that doesn't want to become part of one of the, the, the bigger firms, um, and they were providing assurance that would go into financial statements. I mean, do you think that uh, some of their people would want to become corporate auditors? So my, my question on that really was more about whether Argo would insist that they were as part of this new framework, or do you, there do you think the market would say, well, probably they should be if they're providing that assurance and therefore Argo wouldn't need to get involved. So, you know, recognizing that this will be quite a broad uh, field of, of, of participants that we'd be aiming at. Uh, so, so, so I was initially in the, my reaction to your question is, ye yes, we would be interested in that. Like, so it's, so the hypothetical here is you're, you're not an, a chartered accountant and yeah. you haven't become a, uh, you haven't specialized, but you're nevertheless providing some assurance because you've got some other underpinning qualifications or expertise yeah, that yeah. allows you to, you know, to, to give, to give the audit committee that assurance. Would we insist in some way, well, we'd have to have a look at what, what therefore are your underpinning professional uh, qualifications to say that, and that potentially takes us to what other institutes, professional bodies beyond the county might be providing these kinds of orders. So, you know, in relation to cybersecurity, um, there are some accreditation routes to become a cybersecurity yeah. uh, specialist. My middle son is currently in the middle of doing all of that. Uh, you know, when he when he becomes professionally qualified in that space, he probably if he put his name to some assurance statement, probably people go, yeah, fine. Uh, and then, but at the minute, I'm not really committing myself to doing that because it takes us to a, a, a different place. And remember, the actual recommendation is to establish a new institute. Now, that seems like a, a pretty bold play to me, and I, I I don't see how you bring into life a new institute of something. I very much see the commercial reality of the paper that you've written, which is you become a professional in one discipline and then you add on some additional qualifications, which allows you to say, well, I'm now a corporate auditor. I, I totally understand that. And I, I'd be stunned if other, other elements of the market, environmental auditing, cybersecurity, assurance, and I also didn't go down, also didn't go down that route. Okay. Well, lots to discuss there, but very, no, very interesting and uh, interesting to see the proposals written out. So, um, Michelle, I could ask a lot more, but I suspect I should probably pass back to you. 
Thanks, David. Um, well, I'll, I'll keep on the subject matter, though, of um, sustainability for a moment. So there's a, a comment in the, the, the chat. There's now work in progress to consider setting up an International Sustainability Standards Board under the IFRS Foundation. Fully agreed we need consistent international standards that can be adopted widely across the world. So it's good to hear your views on the importance of international standards for sustainability. Um, I'm absolutely delighted, Sir John, that we've got the Chief Exec of LIFAC, Kevin Dancy, on the webinar. So um, I think this is a good, a good opportunity for me to, um, to invite Kevin to, um, to comment and pose a question. Thanks, Michelle, and uh, thanks, Sir, Sir John. This has been a really interesting uh, talk. Um, no surprise, given where I sit, um, that I'm a big supporter, and IFAC is a big supporter of, uh, of global standards, audit, assurance, ethics. Um, hopefully going forward, um, under the auspices of the IRFRS Foundation for Sustainability Standards, and hopefully coming out of that eventually uh, for uh, global standards on auditing, or assurance, I should say, around sustainability reporting. Um, now, in terms of setting global standards, global doesn't have the market on, <laughs> you know, knowledge and expertise around all standards. There's always a give and take between what happens at the global level, what happens at the jurisdictional level, uh, to really make this uh, work in a, a collaborative way. Uh, now, historically, uh, the UK has always been a good supporter of international standards. And uh, I'm just wondering if you have any comments or thoughts in terms of how you see these new proposals in the UK uh, being either applicable with or aligning with international standards going forward. Because uh, again, from where we sit, uh, having a you know, global set, at least a baseline of international standards is very important uh, to make sure that the markets function effectively. Yeah, sure, very happy to, to answer that. So, so I think the longstanding UK position is that we, uh, we much prefer global standards. We follow the global standards but in some cases we add to those global standards. So if you took um, audit, for example, we, we've adopted the international standards on audit, but in the UK, there are some additional requirements which we add and our publication which sets those out says, this is the global standard and here are some additional local UK standards. So people can see the exact international standards, but then there are supplementary requirements for this uh, for, for the UK. Um, and that is, I think, a long-standing way in which we've done it. Uh, as I said in my remarks, uh, essentially being in, in, in favour of a SASB is a holding position until we get to a global standard and then we would switch from, from one to the other. So uh, I think it's good for us to send a signal to the market that we're in favour of TCFD, supported by SASB metrics, until there is a global standard. Once a global standard is adopted, then we would almost certainly scrap this holding position and adopt the uh, international standard. So we, we will, I think, would remain great supporters of your work and international standards. Now, in, in relation to some of the corporate reporting here, we understand that we're potentially going further than any other country, but again, same principle, these are, the, these are the international standards, but the UK, because you're um, defined as a, PI, a PIE in the UK, then there's some additional uh, UK requirements in accordance with the law. So the underpinning architecture here is absolutely the international standards yeah. supplemented by local. Yeah, perhaps much like you were with the first, you know, you were a first mover when it came to the expanded audit royal court. So uh, we could see more of the same in terms of what we've seen in the recent past. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think, <laughs> thankfully my host has unmuted me. Um, so John, I, I'm conscious of time. So I thought we would, reflect for the next 10 minutes or so on the attractiveness of for the profession of, of some of these reforms, because it, it's going to be a key consideration, I think, for ICAST and the firms that train the future of the profession. And I'd, I was, I'd like to invite our President Catherine Burnett to pose the next question, if I may. Thanks, Michelle, and thank you, Sir John. Um, as Michelle has said, one of the things that um, we as the audit profession are very focused on is the importance of our people and our talent and being able to deliver audit quality. 
um, with some suggesting that perhaps the current environment and regulation means that audit is maybe no longer as an attractive a career choice as it might have been before. Um, I guess I'm interested in your views as to how the recommendations in the report will impact on audit as a career choice, either to improve it or any restrictions it may add. Uh, yeah. Okay. So I'm just gathering my thoughts. So f the, I think the first thing to say is that you know, auditors have taken a bit of a bashing, haven't they, in the popular media. Every time a company collapses, somebody says, "Oh, where are the auditors?" And uh, look, let's be frank. That's that's kind of lazy, isn't it? It's really it's really easy to say, "Oh, well, where are the auditors?" When the actual question was, "What the heck were the board doing?" Uh, when they decided to do X, Y, or Z. When they decided to spend billions of pounds on a website in the mistaken belief that it would add significant revenue and profitability, whacked it on as goodwill, never wrote it down, never saw the additional revenue or profitability, and ultimately haven't borrowed the money, it led to the company collapsing. That, that wasn't the auditors. That was the board. Well, that's a real situation. You can work out which one it is. Um, and, 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 uh, and I'm not making any apologies for that. The, 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 the popular... I think parliamentarians have, have now got this point. It is the board that you have to hold to account. And as Michelle has pointed out several times in this conversation, what this does is raise the bar for the board, running the company, taking responsibility, being more transparent. Um, all of that's a good thing. And what that ought to do is to flow into the audit process. Now, do I think an auditor the audit profession is an attractive one. I think it remains fundamental to our economy to be able to say one way or the other uh, whether these corporate reports are or are not a fair representation uh, of what's happening in this company. I think the, the changes in both methodology and the use of technology, all of which, which, which all the firms are, are, are using, I think makes it really interesting in terms of where do the firms attract future talent from? Because uh, moving from, sorry, to be slightly old fashioned about it, sampling transactions to you can use AI to actually crawl its way through every single transaction there ever was is a very different proposition and it requires a very different sort of set of skills. And some of the big firms are increasingly report, uh, re recruiting people into audit who, who are never going to be chartered accountants. Uh, although those numbers remain really quite buoyant as I understand it. They are data scientists and data analysts um, and technology wizards. And that, I think, just opens up a completely different field for people, which is kind of, I think, makes it even more interesting in terms of being an auditor. Go, I wish I had those tools uh, when I did it more than 20 years ago. You know, just kind of being able to see inside the whole of a transaction set and analyze it from multiple different directions because you've got the actual tools to do it, I think would have been really interesting thing. Uh, to do. Look, the great thing that being an auditor does is it gives you some fantastic skills. It, it, you're allowed to, if you get a diversity of, uh, of audits to do, see lift different companies approaching the same business problems from different sorts of directions. And there's great learning in that for you as you develop along. Firms always, always invest in their people because that's, that's the thing they're selling. It's people and they invest in it uh, massively in my experience. So you're always going to get invested in because the talent is what they sell. Um, so I think it remains a very attractive profession. And we need to say it is, let me reiterate, fundamental to our economy. But audit works well. And that people, when they read an annual report on accounts, can place some reliance on that guy. Yeah, OK, good. That's fine. Now, do we want to invest in this company or not? Well, we can place some reliance on what these people are saying. Uh, but as I said several different times, it's a whole ecosystem approach to raising status, not just about auditors. But I think it remains an a very attractive profession. Good to hear, thank you. And I think the ecosystem point is, is absolutely key, actually, to some of our younger members really understanding the part that auditors play alongside others in the ecosystem. So thank you. Thanks, Catherine. I mean, just looking at it from a, a firm's perspective for a, a, a moment, Sir John, I mean, given the consultation period is four months, um, we've already discussed that we're, we're to anticipate a, a phased implementation period. It's probably going to be a few years before recommendations do take effect. 
Um, what can the, the firms be focusing on now to ensure that they are in the best position to be ready for the changes? Uh, if I was running a firm, I'd be looking at three things, I think. Um, the first is operational separation, right? Because op what operational separation does is to, is to ensure that you have an absolute like laser focus on audit quality. And audit quality exists for me, so I've never run a firm, so but I'll stick my neck out, on two levels. It runs on the level at which you'd conduct every single individual audit. But it also runs at the level of what are all the inputs to that audit that exist at the firm level in terms of training and recruitment and technology and methodology and and all of those all of those things so you've got ingredients at both levels and what operational separation does is to say this is park audit quality at the audit level and think about the firm overall what information do we have what financials do we have what has our risk management work all those kinds of things i think i would i would look at the 22 principles set out in our paper uh, recently updated and say okay what what could i do irrespective of my size what things on this list of 22 could I actually do, even if I was small, right? So, for example, management information. What management information do you have about the audits you're conducting and how good they are? The second thing you need to focus on is audit quality and everything you think makes up audit quality in your firm, whether it be that people and getting better people or whether it's about um, your changing your methodology or whether it's about... Um, improving the technology and analysis or or it's about the use of specialists or it's about um, the capacity and capability of you to do all the audits you need to do right you can you ought to have a, a definite program on thinking about audit quality assessing where you are now and how could you improve that so that's the second thing you could do and the third thing you could do is 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 uh, have a think about transparency because audit reports are not the easiest things to read um, and you know they 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 can be a little opaque about what they're actually really trying to say and that i think is a fair criticism it might be a little over the time it's a fair criticism and that's why some of the media get it wrong because the audit you know the audit report is is difficult to navigate its way through and it's it's not exactly in plain english now i think no you know what i'll get what i'll get in response to that is oh yeah what about liability and yada yada yada, yada. although there's a really really interesting question in the consultation document about why does nobody in the audit market ever limit their liability. We can find almost no cases whatsoever of auditors saying, oh, I'm gonna limit my liability. They, they, there's this kind of, oh yeah, what about like, oh, you know, I have to write these things where they are because the lawyer tells me, because otherwise it opens me up to this liability and that liability. Well, you know, you need, you need to be more creative about that. You can think much, much more creatively about liability and about transparency in terms of what you actually said about what you found, right, or didn't because it's perfectly possible that everything is great and you, you should say that, right? But they're just a bit opaque. Those well, are now that you've mentioned me. that, Sir John, I, I, can see, I, I can see discussions about limitation of liability. I'm going to come back to transparency, actually, because um, I, I do think that the three words that when I read this consultation piece, the three words that struck me were responsibility, accountability, and transparency. Um, so I want to come back to transparency as probably the last, one of the last questions, but can I stay on the attractiveness of the profession? Because obviously Catherine's asked a question from the lens of uh, a firm that is training chartered accountants and business leaders, because the firms are also the training providers of the individuals who then move into business and then become the pie board directors of the future. So that of itself is an ecosystem. Um, I would like to think the members of ICASM are, are a force for good in the organisations in which they work. And, you know, I've, I've been at ICAS 20 odd years and you know, I look at the code of ethics, I look at the individuals, I look at that DNA and that ethical backbone. And I, I think that's the type of, of professional that you would want around the board of a, of a pie in the UK. Mm -hmm. But given the stakes are likely to be higher in the future, how can FRC, ARGA, and the profession, ICAS in this instance, ensure that our senior board level positions remain attractive to chartered accountants? And, and there might be a particular reference to audit committee roles in, in that context. What can we do? Um, well, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not sure it's my, I'm not sure it's really my business. 
I'm not, I'm not, I'm not duck in the, I'm not duck in the question, but look, you, you're absolutely right. What the firms do is, is brilliantly trained people. Uh, and you know, the years I spent at EMY, massive investment in me, constantly promoting, pushing me forward, you know, blah, blah. But, you know, like, like many who work for a firm, they get to the point of thinking, actually, it looks quite interesting to actually run a company. So I'll go and I'll go and do something else. And many people then leave well, go to work in industry, and then they continue their rise, don't they? And we ought to be also very explicit in this conversation. That the vast majority, must be, I don't know, 99% of your members uh, do their job to the best of their ability really well every day, all the time. It's, it's, it's the tiny fraction that skews the public perception about auditors and accountants and ag aggressive accounting and, you know, fraudulent things, right? I mean, but you don't need very many cases that have some significant publicity for people to think, well, you know, maybe they're all like that, but they're not. They're absolutely not. There's no, there's no evidence. There's systemic, systemically, I think accountants do, do fantastic work. Well, I mean, certainly my experience, right? You know, nearly 40 years in the business, is, you know, some brilliant people doing some amazing things, completely hidden from anyone else, solving problems, moving forward, you know, doing incredible things. That get, get, you know, they get the praise inside the organization, but they don't get it outside because, you know, what's happened is, you know, a member of an institute's crashed some company and it's on the front page of, you know, the Financial Times. Um, but is it, is it my job ultimately to think about the attractiveness of being an accountant? And becoming a senior director, I don't, I don't think it is. Sorry. I might, I might challenge If that was your you question. On, it, well, it was, but I'm, I might challenge you on that. And, and statistically, and I used to be director of enforcement many, many moons ago, it's about 0.01% of the profession ends up in, in disciplinary. But it, looking at the consultation paper and the enforcement regime in relation to PI directors, and also the enforcement regime in relation to chartered accountants in non-board positions who happen to be involved in the preparation and the presentation of financial statements. There's a, there's a hefty price to be paid under this new regulatory framework. Um, and so I, I do think there is a, a joint role for, for as co-regulators, shall we say, um, to ensure that those positions are attractive to the profession. I think it'd be a, a, a sad day if, if, if they, they ceased to be attractive to our members. Well, I mean, look, <clears throat> it sounds like this is an ongoing debate, maybe just between <laughs> me and you, and uh, uh, um, which is cool because cool, we're going to have another call about it. But um, <clears throat> the, the reasons why people do what they do are sort of complicated and, and multifaceted aren't they right and ultimately if you want to be the cfo of plc you're doing it for some for some reason uh whether that's about money or the your fab you, you know you love whatever the company does or, or whatever it is that you do right and and you, you know there's got to be a high high chance that actually you probably trained with you know a firm and you're a chart account um i mean many cfos aren't but uh certainly the larger end because it's more about m a more than it's about anything else, um, but I don't, I don't understand. <clears throat> I don't understand what the problem is. We need to be up. We need to be upfront about what really happened with Enron. Was um, that the the chief executive famously said that aggressive accounting is not illegal. It's not the same. But as we all saw when on unwound, that aggressiveness, that deliberate way in which they behaved to present a set of results which were essentially false what was a was a position they took deliberately and there were people who were party to that who could have done something about it but decided not to and what the enforcement regime and these are extreme circumstances right i mean we need to be upfront about this we currently have 41 cases i think like this in, in what we call enforcement out of what thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of potential. Uh, and that's over ooh, eight years. So th the incidence is low. The risk is low. As long as you do your job well, 
with integrity and st stick to your principles. But once you start straying off the path into, well, actually, we'll change those accounting policies and be more and more and more aggressive. What these sets of reforms do is to bring that is to try to bring that to life, either through your own corporate reporting and or through the auditor's reporting, it, and make you really think about, I do I want to do this? Because I I don't think you do. Well, Sir John, you've got the last word. We're about to run out of time. It's it's um it's just coming up to the hour. I've thoroughly enjoyed hearing from you firsthand today. I appreciate this is quite early days in the consultation process, um, but I wanted to uh, to thank you for your your open and uh, your frank responses today. And I'm going to hand you back to Bruce. Thank you. Well, listen, thank you both. And Sir John, I do say not many people get the last word with Michelle, so well done to you. But no, seriously, Michelle, thank you for diligently asking the questions, picking them up from the audience and, and setting the scene. Responsibility, accountability, transparency. And, and Sir John, you absolutely didn't duck a single question. Um, really thought provoking. I think that the, the train has left the station now. This is going to be a really interesting discussion journey for the next few, and, and we all welcome it. And um, We've got a, a number of people on this call listening. Uh, we've got Canada, Hong Kong, US, Japan, as well as the UK. So, so there is international interest, clearly. Uh, but no, thank you both. Um, I quite like the way you ended your, your final word where there was, okay, so we've got 41 enforcements and thousands, tens of thousands, and that's the reality. But, but you are there with a check and balance for those that feel they might stray. I think that's important. But, very wide ranging discussion, very really interesting about the corporate auditor. That's, that's certainly something for us to take away and really think about um, how we can develop our thoughts on that. But, but across the board, I appreciate this will be a very busy week for you. So we're really grateful that you've taken the time to join us today. So, so 